Let's see. This is a sermon on why did Jesus have to die? I've preached on this before. It was four years ago. Um, I had some new thoughts. So I've, uh, I've revised the sermon by about 60% because I, I had some new thoughts that were triggered by the series we just finished on Christian basics. Um, so the scripture for this morning is from the first epistle of John in chapter 4 verses 7 through 11, and then verse 19. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. This is the word of the Lord. So, we have these two weird things in our religion. First, that God became a human being. And second, that when God became a human being, we rejected him and killed him, and he actually died. Now, I dealt with the first, that God became a human being in the Sermon on Christian Basics, Jesus Christ. God became a human being in order to share our lives so that we could share God's life. Many religions have God appearing to human beings and sometimes appearing in human form, but they don't suppose that in doing so, God actually became human. And the two closest religions to Christianity, Judaism and Islam, believe that the suggestion that God actually became a human being is the worst possible blasphemy. It's the most untrue thing that can be said about God. And the crucifixion is even worse for them. If God could not save himself from death, how can he save us? Judaism thinks that the cross proves that Jesus is not God. And it's an, in Islam, where they believe that Jesus is a prophet, they also believe that he didn't really die on the cross, that God took him straight to heaven without him having to die first, because it seems to them ridiculous that God's prophet would have to die. But we believe that God became human in order to truly share our lives, not just know about them. <clears throat> and also in order that we could share God's life, not just know about it. And we believe that Jesus died on the cross to heal us from our brokenness. So why does the cross do that? And how does the cross do that? And was the cross really necessary? in order to do that. God is God, after all. He can do anything. Could he not have forgiven our sins without dying from them, for them? He was God. <clears throat> he could do anything. Could he not have given us eternal life without dying first? He was God. He could do anything, couldn't he? We need to look at this question carefully. God can do anything, can't he? Hmm. Because we're going to find that the answer is no. And when we understand why the answer is no, we'll be able to understand why God did what he did in Jesus. So there's this old paradoxical question. Kids even ask it in school. Can God make a rock so big that God can't move it? And then one way of looking at it, the answer would be simple. Yes, of course. All God has to do is pick out a rock and choose and will with God's powerful will to never, ever move that rock. And then, of course, God can't move that rock. He's chosen not to. Not because it's so big, nor because God is not strong enough, but because God has chosen. And God cannot break faith or act in self-contradiction. But that's not what was meant, someone might say. Can God make a rock so big 
that God could not move it even if God wanted to. But when we put it this way, we can see that the question now amounts to a contradiction. It amounts to, can God choose to do what God chooses not to do? And putting the question this way exposes the absurdity of it. God cannot do what God has already chosen not to do. God cannot do anything. There are things that God cannot do, but not because God is limited or because God is weak, where there seems to be some constraint upon what God can and can't do, it arises not from external conditions, but from God's own determination to act consistently with the choices that God has already made. <clears throat> so what we need to understand is why God chose to die on the cross as Jesus, as the way to save us and to heal our sins. We might think that God could have chosen to let us live forever without Jesus having to die. And we might think that God could have chosen to forgive our sins without Jesus having to die. So why did God not do it this way? <clears throat> you may remember in the Garden of Eden, when we fell into sin, there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was not the tree of life that was forbidden to us, but the other one, God did intend for us to live forever. But after we had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, after we had fallen, then God said, so that they don't put out their hands and take of the tree of life and eat, God put us out of the garden and set an angel at the door of the garden to guard the way. So why did God do this? Put us away, separate us from the tree of life, if he meant us to live forever. <clears throat> I had a friend, Richard McClellan, from whom I learned a lot when I first became a Christian. And his explanation was this. We were put out of the garden and denied access to the tree of life because if we had eaten of the tree of life, at that time, just after we had fallen, in our fallen condition, then we would have had to live forever as fallen beings. We would have had to live with our sins forever. We would have had to endure the brokenness we have inside of us throughout an eternal life. And this, as far as I can tell, is the true definition of hell. <clears throat> I cannot imagine a more frightening prospect. Is there one of us here who has not lived through days so dark and sorrowful, so sad and guilty, so much our own fault, and for that reason, so unbearable, that if they did not pass, we could not stand them. We make our own hell. But it is far beyond our power to make a heaven. We were put out of the garden so that we might be redeemed, we might be changed, so that the wrong we had done to ourselves would not become permanent, so that we might live the eternal life that God meant to share with us, as redeemed beings, as changed people, we had to die as the fallen beings we were in order to be brought back to life as the redeemed beings that we could be. If we are going to be able to bear the burden of eternal life, then we're going to have to be healed. And we talked in one of our sermons under Christian Basics about sin, about how we are broken people, about how all the things that we do wrong are because of a brokenness within us that we call sin. And that brokenness is that we don't trust God. We stopped trusting God in the garden and thus we fell. And we have never fully trusted God since. And so we can't heal ourselves. But why did God choose his own death as the way to heal us? Sin, that brokenness, is like a disease in our nature because we were created good and we were meant to be good and we were meant to remain good. And in order to make forgiveness complete and eternal life bearable, God has to put sin to death in order to make us good again. Now, I suppose that God could have chosen to put sin to death without Jesus having to die. So why didn't he do it this way? I think it's because sin is not an external disease. 
like pneumonia or rabies or COVID. It's not caused by an external organism. Sin is a disease of the self, of the will. It is we ourselves who are sinful. It is we ourselves who choose and want what is wrong. It's we ourselves who choose to do evil. And the easy way to put sin to death without Jesus having to die is very simple. All God has to do is to put us to death. That would be simple. That would be just. That would cleanse the world and it would satisfy God's justice. But it would not satisfy his love. Remember this morning's scripture. Love is what this is all about. God wants us to love one another. God himself loves us. So a solution that doesn't have love in it as the most, in base, as the most basic ingredient of how it works is not going to fulfill God's will. It's not going to be a solution that is consistent with the choices that God has already made. God already chose to love us when he created us. He already chose to be our God and to have us as God's people. He already chose to love us when he became human to share our lives. It is because of the intimate difficulty of putting sin to death without putting us to death along with it, without ceasing to love us, that God chose that Jesus should die for us. Jesus went to death on the cross for our sakes in order that sin might be put to death without our having to be put to death with it. Because sin is more like a cancer than a bacterial or viral infection. And that which kills the cancer tends to kill the body as well. This is why radiation and chemotherapy are so hard on a person. In order to put sin to death without killing us in the process, Jesus had to cure our brokenness. He had to restore trust between us and God. And it is not easy to trust God. It's not easy to trust God, at least not anymore, not since we broke that trust. God seems so big and so far away. God seems so demanding and so judgmental. God has to get us to trust him again without violating our free will without making us into characters in a novel that God is writing. That's the hard part for God, changing us without violating our freedom, because God already chose that we would be free beings and chose that even in the face of the possibility that we would choose the wrong thing. Changing us without violating our freedom is the thing that is harder for God to do than it was to create the universe. It's the thing that is so difficult that only God could do it. And the critical ingredient is love. Love is how people change without violating their freedom. There's never been a married couple who have not had to change in order to stay with one another. They do it freely for the sake of love, truly changing, but still truly free because of love. There have never been true friends who would be willing to die for one another, who did not have to change in order to build a relationship that close. There have never been parents and children who did not have to change for one another and change freely in order to maintain their relationship. And all these people are able to make these changes and do it freely for the sake of love, truly changing, but still truly free because of love. I spent almost an hour thinking while taking a walk just on this last paragraph, this realization that love is what makes it possible to change without losing freedom. And if you get a chance this week, you should try something like that. Lay aside some time, some real time, 15 minutes, half an hour at least, and think about some relationship in which you are so close and so bound together that you have to change in order for the relationship to be maintained, but you have to change by free choice out of love in order for the relationship not to be oppressive. 
So the problem for God is love. Not for God to love us. That's not hard for God at all. God has done that from the beginning. God has kept doing it all these long years since. The problem is that God has to get us to love him. And he has to get us to do it freely. He has to change us by enlisting our free will, not by changing it. And we sin because we are broken inside. And we're broken inside because we do not trust God. So God is going to have to get us to trust him again. And not just by flipping a switch in our hearts and minds. And that trust can only be created by love. It's hard for us to trust God because he is so far away. So God comes close. He comes to live with us as Jesus. It's hard for us to trust God because he's so powerful. So he lays aside his godly power when he comes close and lives a life that has limits like ours do. For all the miracles Jesus did, he still had limits. And it's hard to trust God because he is not like us. So he becomes like us, he becomes one of us. It's hard to trust God because he is so demanding and so judgmental, so determined about what is right and what is wrong. So he fulfills his demands himself as Jesus. And as Jesus, he gives judgment. And the judgment he gives is that we're not going to be judged. Jesus is going to be judged, not us. And whatever price there may be to pay for not judging us, he'll pay it himself. And it's hard to trust God because he is God and nothing hurts him. Whereas we suffer. We have aches and pains. We get sick, miserably sick. We die. And sometimes we die in misery and pain. And apart from physical suffering, we suffer emotionally and spiritually. We suffer the pangs of guilt and regret and sorrow and hatred and anger and despair. So God lets it all hurt him too. That is what the cross is all about. God lets it hurt him too. God accepts and feels and suffers everything that we do. And when we see that God holds nothing back, and when we see that God does not stay in heaven where it is safe, and when we see that God shares everything that happens to us, especially the bad stuff, even though he doesn't have to, when we see that he loves us first, then we are able to trust him. Then we are able to love him. And when we trust him again, because he loves us first and shares our sufferings, then the brokenness of not trusting him is healed. We trust him again. When we love him again, then the brokenness of sin is he healed and we are able to love one another and our own freedom and choice is part of it. That is why Jesus had to die, so that we would trust him and love him. That is why Jesus had to die, so that we could be changed without violating our freedom. That is why Jesus had to die, because he loved us. Amen.